All right, so let's talk about the Privacy Act of 1974. So the Privacy Act of 1974 was an act that was passed here in the US meant to help protect the privacy of individuals within the US uh, from the US government. Now, it only applies to uh, people who, uh, or, or to data, sorry, to data that the government owns. So it's only about government databases and it's only about protection of that information on that governmental level. This does not apply in any way to private entities or companies that are not uh, related to government data holdings, right? So the Privacy Act of 1974 is about, again, protecting individuals' privacies uh, from the US government. Now, something to keep in mind about this, this was, first of all, the Privacy Act of 1974. So this came about in the 70s when data collection was really starting to take off, but really before the information age really hit. So this is kind of a little bit about outdated in some senses, um, but it's also not entirely without uh, merit, without importance in our current politics. So the Privacy Act of 1974 allows us to make sure that our data is protected in a variety of ways, and you can read exactly which ways that it tries to protect our data. But one of the important things, other than that it's a government-only uh, act, it does not impact, again, uh, companies or other private organizations, uh, it also has no one to enforce it. So without somebody to enforce this Privacy Act, I really want to pose the question to you all of whether or not this even matters. So even though we have this as a protection on our privacy, does it really matter if there's no one to enforce it? It doesn't fall under any branch of government or any existing uh, organization from the government to enforce and to make sure that we are abiding by. So it begs a lot of questions about if we have privacy laws, who's going to be responsible for making sure that the government abides by them? And how do we enforce these privacy laws? If we make them just for the government, it's probably an internal government agency. If we make them for also the public, such as uh, private organizations that are not related to government use, then how do we make sure those companies are abiding by whatever privacy laws that we put into place? This is really tricky because a lot of the times the private the data that gets collected on consumers is not necessarily data that other organizations are going to have access to. Right? Take a look, for example, at something like Facebook. Facebook. They collect so much data about all of the people who are on Facebook, right? They also pair that with data they have from Instagram and WhatsApp because they also own those two. Uh, holdings as well, those two uh, social medias as well. So they can use all of that data to either provide ads or otherwise generate information about their consumers, about what they would like to maybe try to sell them or otherwise sell to other organizations in order to, you know, make more money or do whatever it is that Facebook wants to do. So how do we enforce our expectations, our legal requirements, of privacy onto organizations and what kind of agency would we need to do that? That's a really big question that we don't really have an answer to right now. Now, we also can talk about other things about concerns and, and data that we have within the US. So not just really this Privacy Act, but there's other things that we kind of need to be concerned about when we're talking about privacy. And one of those is, pro sorry, predictive policing. All right, so predictive policing is using data in order to anticipate where we expect crime to happen. So, for example, if we know that, let's say, the downtown square in Cookville has a high amount of criminal activity, then we're going to want to make sure that we have officers going through there regularly to try to discourage crime or catch people in the act. That is predictive policing. 
But predictive policing also takes on other metrics or other aspects when we talk about things like the sci-fi movie Minority Report. Now, many of you may not have seen Minority Report. It is an older movie uh, now. I believe it's been redone actually recently, though. Uh, but Minority Report, the idea is that we can use AI to predict who will commit a crime and we arrest them before they even commit it. Is this something that we want to do? And what is the ethics of trying to prevent crime in this way? Predictive policing has a lot of impact in our law enforcement and how they handle uh, crimes that are either about to occur or are likely to occur in particular areas. Another thing that we uh, have concerns about at a national level is a national ID. So right now we have stuff like a social security number or SSN, which allows us to identify people for tax purposes. Now this was never meant to be a way to identify individuals uh, in the US for other purposes. It was meant only for tax reasons. But since the initiation of the social security number, Everybody in the US now has one, and we also use it for things such as loans, applications to colleges, and even on our job forms. So that number is being used as a personal identifier, and it puts us at risk for identity theft. Uh, it also isn't necessarily a secure number. Again, this was only meant for tax records and not meant as a comprehensive ID to identify specific individuals. We also have something like a driver's license, so most people, again, in the US have a driver's license. And with this driver's license comes a lot of information that is available on it. And also something that's recently getting implemented called a real ID. So a real ID is essentially there's federal uh, recommendations, requirements, uh, for driver's licenses, which allow them to be used in the, a broader sense than what they've been used in the past, such as now for boarding, they're now going to be required for boarding airplanes within the US. Now, driver's licenses aren't required by individuals, and there are certain requirements in order to have one. For instance, you have to have a certain uh, vision, right? You have to be able to see uh, a certain amount in order to pass your exam to get your license. You have to have a stable home address. And there's other things that go into that driver's license, which isn't necessarily uh, universal for people within the US. So there's questions about whether or not something like this is appropriate for something like boarding an airplane, right? Or as a mechanism for voting. Right. If we want to identify people when they come to the polls and make sure that they have a photo ID on them, more likely than not, it is your driver's license. But not everybody, again, has or even needs a driver's license. So is that an appropriate way for us to identify people at a national or even state level? So there's questions about implementing what we call a national ID, which I would like you all to discuss in the course teams channel. So there's questions about whether or not a national ID would help us address some of these problems that we're having with the that social security number and the driver's license and whether or not this is something we want our government to be able to do. So there's arguments for both for and against it within the book and I want you to take and apply a ethical theory to all of these different pro and con arguments and have a discussion about whether or not you think it's moral or ethical for us to do this. Now there's also things such as FERPA, which is your educational uh, records rights and HIPAA, which is your health rights, uh, health record rights. So it's really important that you understand some of these types of acts that have been passed and how they impact you and your particular privacy. So with FERPA and HIPAA, FERPA is something you really need to know about because if you're enrolled in my course, then you have FERPA rights, you have education record rights, and FERPA is clearly defined about what kind of rights you have. I'm sure many of you already know what those are, or at least uh, in a tangential sense, you know what those are, because one of the things we tell you when you're a freshman, or you should have heard at some point when you were a freshman, is that we cannot tell your parents your grades, right? This is something you have to do and you have to release to them if you want them to know that information. But we as instructors have very big restrictions about what we can and can't say about students within our courses and even whether or not they are enrolled. HIPAA is similarly done 
for healthcare data. So when you go to your doctor, it discusses what information is allowed to be said to external entities, as well as to other individuals within your family circle. You have to sign forms saying that the health court healthcare organization is allowed to release that data and information to specific people that you trust. And that is because of the HIPAA protections. Now in the next video, we're going to talk about the Freedom of Information Act and some general violations of privacy that we see on a regular basis.